Good day and welcome to Southeast Alaska. Today we're going to share with you a trip that we took on a National Geographic boat several years ago and I hope that you're going to enjoy seeing a part of the world as we saw it, away from the big cities and into the wilderness of Southeast Alaska. Southeast Alaska is that area circled in red. When most people think about Alaska, they think about that large northern section. Southeast Alaska is an area where it is pristine and beautiful, and we hope that you'll enjoy it. This is Southeast Alaska. The area to the right of the red lines is Canada. And so it is a narrow strip of land that is part of, of, of Alaska. The yellow line is where our boat will be taking us today. Just trying to show you that we're going to do an extensive tour throughout the area. The area in green is known as the Tongass National Forest. 17 million acres of huge trees, temperate rainforests, very, very deep fjords, booming waterfalls, some steep mountain peaks, but most importantly, fascinating amounts of wildlife, glaciers, and some of the rarest types of flora and fauna in the world. The Tongass National Forest is the largest national forest in the United States. And to a great deal, it's like anywhere else in the world. It is home to humpback and orca whales, beavers, wolves, and the largest and densest concentration of grizzly bears and bald eagles found on the planet. But it's more than just a pretty place. <clears throat> it is a buffer against climate change. It absorbs about 8% of what the United States puts out in pollution. And it stores about 12% of all the carbon that we have in the United States. But there is trouble in paradise. The Tongass National Forest is under threat by the federal government to allow clear cutting of rare and valuable old trees. Nature's way of helping us deal with the pollution problem that we create here in the lower 48. There are people in Washington who want to sacrifice that sink for pollution to profits from large corporations. If you've never seen a clear-cut forest, let me tell you, it is not a pretty sight. Dependence upon the land is a way of life in Southeast Alaska. Alaska. It's a necessity, but they have the ability to have abundant fish and wildlife. It is the home to approximately 70,000 people spread about 32 communities, but most lived, almost 32,000 of that 70, live in the capital, Juneau. The region is often referred to as called the Inside Passage, a passage or waterway that extends all the way from Washington State all the way up through Southeast Alaska. As such, 
the primary jobs in the community are fishing and tourism. These industries pump almost a billion dollars into the economy of Southeast Alaska every year. Although there are only 70,000 people that live in the area, over a half million people visit Southeast Alaska every year. But primarily, they are primarily on large cruising boats coming up the inland waterway. This is the Tongass National Forest. Beautifully dotted with lakes and rivers and beautiful trees, as you'll see in a few minutes. These trees have been around for a long time. Walking through the forest is a joy. We'll begin our visit today in Sitka, Alaska. It's a town on the coast, the Pacific coast. During the 1800s, Sitka was a major port with ships calling from all around the world. Why? They're coming here for furs to be transported to Europe. After the United States purchased Alaska from Russia in 1867, Sitka was the capital of the area of Alaska. It was previously the Russian capital of Alaska. And it remained the capital of the territory until 1906, when it was moved, the capital was moved to Juneau. Sitka has some interesting statistics from my perspective. There are no roads connecting to it. It's an island, but it has eight, 14 miles of paved roads. And what amazed me was you see people with all sorts of new cars, and I'll tell you how they get there later on. It's not a very warm place. Uh, the average temperature in August is 56. But average temperature in January is 36. But being on the Pacific coast, it gets a lot of rain. It rains three days out of five. The average rainfall is 30, 132 inches. Some of you may have read the book by James Michener on Alaska. He wrote it in Sitka. Alaska, for those of you who have been there, know that it's a very, very, very rural area. And so there is a high school in Sitka, a boarding high school run by the state for students that cannot get to a school system. They come and they live in Sitka and go to high school. This is Sitka. A town that still retains some of its Russian heritage. That's a town that is very important to mariners. To the left, you'll see a large runway where commercial aircraft do come in, but also to the right of that runway, you'll see some buildings. It is the Sitka Coast Guard Station. It is the premier search and rescue 
for an area that extends almost 12,000 miles of coastline and isolated and rugged areas. They are responsible for your safety and the safety of mariners. This region is tough. It includes numerous remote villages and mountainous terrain, and as I mentioned, severe weather. And being rugged, they have to build fuel catches and landing sites at some very inhospitable places. These are some of the pictures of Coast Guard, the helicopters that go out and do that rescue. The picture in the top right is one of those helicopter ports that they have built in rugged areas and also a fuel catch. The bottom picture is of C-130. I have some personal knowledge of these folks. Carol taught at a school in Howard County, and one of the teachers was taking one of those large ships on an inland cruise. She became very, very ill partway down the inland waterway. And one of those helicopters went in and lifted her off. Lifted her off to Ketchikan, which is a another major town in Southeast Alaska, and then she was flown to Seattle, where she spent two months battling for her life. The good news is she recovered. She recovered and she's continued to travel, but she's also a resident, not here at CLV, but our facility in Ellicott City. This is Sitka. They said it is a fishing town, but it's also big because the tourist boats stop here. Downtown Sitka with its Russian Orthodox Church. Remind you, this used to be the capital of the Russian territory known as Alaska. So consequently, there's still a very rich Russian tradition here. To include dance troops, one way uh, the locals make some money is uh, when the big ships come in and make a stop, uh, they put on Russian dance shows. They're very entertaining. We went to one. But it also has a significant population of Native Americans, or as I like to use the, the Canadian term, first people, the tinglet. They live here and have done so a lot longer than Russians or Americans. There is a little park outside of town where you see the Pacific Redwoods. You can walk through it, but you also see a number of totem poles that have been carved and built by the Tinglet people. We leave Sitka and we're going to be getting on our boat. We're going to be going through the forest and over to the Chatham Strait and the inland waterway. As I mentioned, most folks that visit the area do so on very, very large uh, cruise ships. This is one of them going up through the inland waterway. We were on a National Geographic boat 
a much smaller boat. It only held about 60 passengers versus several thousand. One of the things you'll see in the foreground of this picture is a Zodiac. During our tour, we would cruise from point A to point B, but every morning we'd get off and go on a Zodiac or kayaks, do a little bit of touring as you'll see, and then we would come back, have lunch, in the afternoon, we'd go off on the Zodiacs again. So we spent <clears throat> a lot of time off of the boat, going around and seeing this great wilderness. This is part of the Tungus Forest and the path that you go through. One of the advantages of being on the small boat, we could go through this particular passage whereas the large boats cannot. The large boats can't go through because it's very narrow, and also the currents through there are very tricky. There'd be a danger of grounding. As we went through, <clears throat> I was able to take some pictures which I really, really adore. Uh, there was a couple of sailboats anchored, and here was an eagle just about to land on top of that mask. This is a close-up of an eagle. As you know, thanks to DDT, they were almost destroyed here in the Southern 48. But they are numerous. So much so, some of the locals call them flying rats. They're so many. Sitka has a McDonald's, believe it or not, and there must have been several hundred eagles sitting on top of McDonald's when we went by. The picture to the left is that same eagle. He's the male. The picture to the right is of a female eagle. Cruising by, we saw many, and this is one. It's kind of hard to see, a little fuzzy, but there's an eagle up in there, and it's an eagle's nest. We come out into Stratum, the area of the Inland Waterway. You see beautiful snow tap mountains. When we were there, it was the middle of May, and the snow was still prevalent on the top of the mountains. As we cruised along, you start to see primarily humpback whales. We did see a couple of orcas, but mostly humpback whales. As I say, our boat would come in and we would anchor and we would get out and get into kayaks or the Zodiacs and pedal around some very, very little scenic areas. On the second day that we were there, we had anchored off of this rocky beach, or sandy rocky beach, and there was, it's a little hard to see, there's a brown blob there in the middle of the beach. It is a grizzly. And our guide say, well, He'll be moving on. We'll do lunch and then we'll go in. And we're all saying we're going to go in where there's been a grizzly walking the beach. And the answer was yes. We took the Zodiac in. They bring in the kayaks and where we are standing right where the grizzly bear had been. You can even see his tracks in the sand. But then we get in our kayaks and we get out. This is us. I'm taking the picture. That's Carol with the back of her head as we're out in the water. Let me tell you, it's a bit of a challenge to be in a two-person kayak. 
getting ourselves coordinated. It took us a couple of days to where we could be proficient at doing the kayaking. While out there, we would see whales. This is one blowing. You can see it coming up off of the water. And this is one of those humpback whales. This is one of our group that got very, very close to that humpback whale. Another day we stopped, took the boats in, and then we walked up through the forest. It is a rainforest. The rainforest because, again, all that moisture coming across the Pacific Ocean, hitting the mountains, and then dropping. And as a result, lots of lush vegetation vegetation that is helping us out in the lower 48 absorb our pollution. Some beautiful fast moving streams in the lower right of this picture, but you also get a sense of the dense forest. At one point we were walking along and there's a tree similar to the one in the left of the picture and our guide one of the benefits, there was only 60 of us on board the boat, and there were six naturalists that occur, uh, accompanied us. And as we're walking along, one of the naturalists pointed out the claw marks on a tree where a grizzly had recently been. Throughout the region, there are just these beautiful, fast moving streams with little waterfalls. This is one of the naturalists explaining to us how the forest rejuvenates itself. Clear cutting, as I mentioned, would harm the forest totally. The forest needs to have a natural life. A natural life where the trees grow up, they may last a hundred plus years, but when they fall, they start to rot and they serve a purpose because the living trees drop the seeds onto the rotting trees and the seedlings then grow in the rotting tree. And as the tree rots in down into the ground, it begins to grow as a mature tree. This needs to happen because the earth is not very deep. It's very rocky. If you dig down the soil, it only goes down a foot of two and then you hit solid rock. So this kind of rejuvenation needs to continue to happen in order to have this forest. If you clear cut it, it won't happen. We now move up Chatham Strait and we're going to a place called Glacier Bay. Glacier Bay is a national park. It was designated so in 1925. It is also a World Heritage Site. It covers over 5,000 square miles. As I said, almost a half million people visited on the large cruise ships every year. It is a unique place. It has numerous glaciers. It is also very deep. At one point, it is over 1,500 feet deep. There is some form of precipitation in the area almost every day. The average snowfall in the area 
is 14 feet. There are places in the mountains, particularly one mountain called Fairweather, where the snow will get over a hundred feet a year. The bluish area on the right of this map is Glacier Bay. And we'll be going all the way up to the Grand Pacific Glacier and the Marjorie Glacier. But I want to show you there are other glaciers all around. The one we're going to go to, the Grand Pacific Glacier, is a very short glacier. It is only 35 miles long and it's two miles wide. And it runs between 60 to 80 feet thick. When we see it, we're going to see it calving, meaning ice falling off. And it does so by moving about a foot to a foot and a quarter a day. The Marjorie Glacier is a much deeper glacier. It's over 250 feet thick, but it's narrow. It's only one mile, and it's only 21 miles long. Wildlife in the area. There are over 160 different types of fish over 300 different types of birds, 41 different types of mammals, but there are no snakes. This is Mount Fairweather, where you can, it's at the beginning of Glacier Bay. It's the place where you can get 100 foot of snow. It's called Mount Fairweather because it's very unusual and we were very lucky to be there on a day where there weren't any clouds because it's usually either raining or snowing. As we move into the bay, we start to see very steep mountains, very rocky, very barren, very lonely in some ways, but also very beautiful. We had a little experience. This is a sea lion going after salmon. I have a video of this, but I'm not showing it today, where this particular sea lion, we were out in one of those rubber zodiacs, and this sea lion didn't particularly like us being there while he was feeding. Came over to the edge of the boat, looked up at us, and then swam back and dove under the boat. These things weigh up to 1,500 pounds. I figured he was going to come straight up and topple us over. Luckily, he didn't. He came up the other side and swam off. A little bit disgusting, but what they do is they grab the salmon and then they shake them with their heads until the salmon just splits up onto pieces. And that's when they eat the salmon. We move further up through very snow-covered bay. Should be, because it's Glacier Bay. In the foreground there is one of the glaciers. As we move up, we get close to this little island. And what's unique about this island is the sea lions. Sea lions staying on and sunning themselves. In the distance, you can see one of the large cruise ships going up. Only two cruise ships, large cruise ships, are allowed in the bay each day. The bay is 60 miles long. They do that to minimize the pollution in the bay. 
but you can see how close we were to the sea lions versus the large ship. Another picture of the sea lions. You notice how they're all close together. They stay close together as a, when they're sunning themselves, as a means to protect themselves. If an intruder comes along, and it wouldn't happen usually on this island, but it could, and you'll see why in a minute, a grizzly. A grizzly is their enemy. And if one of the lions see or feel a threat, it moves, and they all move at once, diving into the water. Continuing up through the bay, this is where a recent avalanche just occurred. You can see where the snow broke away and went down the mountain. The area is both cold, snow, and barren of trees, but it is beautiful unto itself. As we're going up the bay, we all of a sudden saw this grizzly, a very, very large male grizzly bear, get in the water. The bay is about two miles wide at this point, and he started swimming across. And so we did, the boat did something that it could do, being small. Cut the engine, and we floated across the bay with the grizzly bear. And it was amusing, you know, when he got out of the water, he was exhausted. But he, like a dog, he shook to shake off all the water. It was amusing. These are white mountain goats. Again, you see the, the barrenness of the area and all these grooves in the rock. That's because the glaciers used to come all the way down the bay and they carved out these areas in the mountains. Unfortunately, the glaciers are receding. And so now we have to go 60 miles up the bay to get to one. I don't understand how they stay so snow white. As we're going along, we saw another grizzly walking along what must be a well-worn path. You can see the path along the rocks. And then we came to our favorite grizzly that we got within maybe 30 yards of. And I learned something about a grizzly. Grizzlies do not eat warm-blooded animals. They do only about 10% of the time. They'll go after fish, particularly salmon. But their primary diet is they are a vegetarian. They eat grass and tree leaves. And this was a young grizzly. He seemed to pay no attention to us whatsoever, but just continued wandering along, eating grass. We now come to the Marjorie Glacier. Very, very beautiful. I'm going to be quiet for the next couple of pictures because what I'm going to show you is this glacier calving. Now, you need to understand that at po this point, below the water, the depth is 600 feet. Most of the calving that causes icebergs occurs underneath the water. 
Well, when it does, it carves out an area that is very fragile at the top and it starts to break off where we can see. But most of the ice coming off of the glacier, you do not see because it happens underwater. But I'm going to flick through slides for the next couple of ones and hopefully you will see this glacier calving. Getting a little closer, you can see how close we got. Up close and personally, you can see at one foot a, year, a day to travel 35 miles, how the ice just forms in unique patterns. We're starting. At this point, those big chunks of ice have broken off as well as some underneath. And a large wave is headed our way. Luckily, the captain pointed the bow right into the wave and it was like a roller coaster for a couple of minutes until the sea or the bay settled down. We leave the glacier and we head south. We're going to come out of Glacier Bay, come through again down through Icy Strait, and we're going to come down to the Frederick Sound and a town called Petersburg. As we coming down, we saw numerous whales. We're now down at Petersburg and a little story that I want to share. One of the benefits is each evening as we pass by a village or somebody would come out and give us a talk about the area. One evening as we we're coming towards Petersburg, a lady came out and she gave us, explained the way of life in Petersburg. It's a large fishing port. After her presentation, we sat down to dinner and I had the pleasure of sitting next to her. Carol was to my right. And we got to chatting. And I asked her how long she had lived in Petersburg. And she said, only about 15 years. And I said, oh, where did you come from? Did you come from Juneau or elsewhere in Alaska? She said, no. She said, I'm a graduate of Virginia Tech. And I grew up in Virginia Beach. My major was eco um, looking ecology. And so I came to do research here in Southeast Alaska. And I met my husband who is a fisherman. And so I stayed and raised my family. But she said, I still have ties back to Virginia because when we eat crab, we eat it with Old Bay. As I mentioned, this is a large fishing area. There are about 3,000 residents located on the northern tip of a very wooded island, again, still within the Tongass National Forest. It is a town that celebrates its Norwegian heritage. Remember, Sitka had a Russian heritage. Petersburg had a lot of Norwegians that came and set up a commercial fishing enterprise here. There is a glacier nearby. So when it was first set up, that glacier was very important because they could use the ice 
to pack the fish. There are over 500 commercial fishing boats located in Petersburg. It is the 15th highest ranking port in terms of the value of seafood brought into the United States. Last year, over 100 million pounds of seafood were landed in Petersburg. Thought you might like to see the types of housing that they live in. And you can see their cars. Looks like Main Street, but also looks a little bit different. Some of the folks that are a little bit more wealthy have some bigger houses in town. This is the local Norwegian hall, and you can see the Viking boat that they're proud of up there on the dock. This is the lifeblood of Southeast Alaska. This is the Alaska State Fisher State ferry service. It runs from Washington State. There are four such ferries like this. There are no roads connecting Southeast Alaska to the rest of the world. The only way in and out is by the ferry or by an airplane. So consequently, these people, they get goods, they order them from Amazon down in Washington. They're put onto the ship and when they get to the local dock, they get their packages. Likewise, you may have noticed they have cars, modern, you know, new cars, even though there may only be 10 to 15 miles of paved road in the area. They buy their cars by telephone in Washington. The dealers put them onto the ferry and they retrieve them when they get to their port. We are now leaving and going up to Tracy Arm. An area that is located about 45 miles south of Juno. It is a classic fjord. Again, if you've been to Norway and seen the deep fjords there, very, very similar. But this time the mountains go up to seven to 10,000 feet and they are steep. The fjord has the greatest combination of mountains waterfalls, wildlife, yes, glaciers, and you're going to see some icebergs. Some of the icebergs can be the size of a small car. As we go up, you'll see icebergs framed by the sheer mountains. One of the interesting things from the area, as we've mentioned, there are lots of whales. Now, most of the whales are humpbacks and they don't attack other mammals. But the orcas, those white and dark black whales, they do. And they come here and they hunt for seals. Well, it's unique in Tracy Arm. The seals go there to have their pups because the whales don't come up because the iceberg play with and harm the whale's sonar. And so they get disoriented. So they do not go into Tracy Arm. Tracy Arm is a very long, narrow, and as I say, a very high mountainous area. The glaciers used to come almost all the way down 60 years ago or so. They've receded. Today, most of the glacier 
while it calves in the United States and Southeast Alaska, most of this area, the glaciers are actually in Canada. This is going up through Tracy R. Again, the large ships only go part way up. They don't go all the way. The valleys and the sheerness of the mountains and the cliffs are just amazing and beautiful. As the glaciers have etched away over the years, even those mountains, those mountains have been etched away previously by the <clears throat> by the glaciers. But I find the rock formations and the sediment of the rock to be unique. As we get up the mountain, the fjord narrows in even closer, and you start to see some small breaks off or a little, little iceberg, shall we say. There are gorgeous waterfalls that start up at six or seven thousand feet and rush down the mountains. Very narrow, but that's a drop of over a thousand foot right there. This was a unique waterfall coming down. To the right of the waterfall, you can see a little hole where the water has drilled through that rock and is now seeping out. This is how close we would get to those waterfalls. Here is one of those seals. They like to get up on some of the little icebergs and small icebergs and just float away, feeling very safe knowing that the orca whales do not come up. This is one of the glaciers we pass. It is the Baird glass, Baird Glacier. I always say it, my middle name is Baird, B-A-I-R-D. It's named after one of the former heads of the Smithsonian Institute, John Baird. We're getting up closer to the glacier that we're trying to get to see. That foreground is not the, uh, the upper part of the picture is in Canada. We're about to cross that line. We're still in Southeast Alaska, but most of that ice is in Canada. Starting to get icier and the captain was getting a little bit worried about not the ice puncturing the hull, but getting trapped in the ice. Again, this is middle of May, and the water is just starting to warm up. And his concern was that we would get in there and get surrounded by ice and trapped. Didn't happen, but that was a concern. I love this picture. Well, I'm taking it straight down, looking into the water, and yet you can see the reflections of the mountains in the water. This is one of the larger icebergs floating down. Remember, you only see 10% of the iceberg. The rest is underwater. Again, the ice is swirling around us. The captain's trying to make a decision. He found some open water and decided to anchor and lower the zodiacs. He wasn't going in, but we were going in in the zodiacs. Here we are in the zodiacs going through the ice, and you can hear the ice scrunching underneath the rubber boat. I'm saying, I hope this thing is going to not puncture. Here we are getting up next to the icebergs. 
This is not. This is the actual color of the icebergs. They have all different colors. This is not a retouched photograph. The colors are dependent upon the density of the ice, how much of it's been compressed. And it makes almost for a Disneyland type experience seeing these different colors and being able to get up close and personal with the others. This is us going through the ice, trying to find a way up to the edge of the glacier. This is about as close as we got. And we started looking at some of the icebergs and the beautiful blue. The denser the ice, the more vivid the blue. All sorts of interesting shapes as they, you can hear the water just trickling down as the top of the iceberg is melting. This is going in, person to my left, we're about to go in and touch one of the icebergs. Whether they come down, the glacier comes down and it chunks out rock and you can see a piece of rock still lodged inside of the glacier. This was an awe-inspiring part of the trip. And now you can see one of the glaciers going down the bay. Again, you're only seeing 10% of that glacier, of that glacier iceberg. We're in our final part of our journey. We're coming out and we're going to go up to Juneau. Juneau, again, is the capital of, of Alaska. It's not Anchorage, which is the large city up in, in Alaska, Juneau. Juneau has a population of about 32,000 people or over close to half of the people that live in Southeast Alaska. This is Juneau, one of the popular stops of the larger cruise ships. In the lower left, you can see one of the cruise ships. This is a gondola that goes up the top of a mountain, but it is a very prosperous little town. To me, when I look at, looked at it, I say, in the mountains, if you've been to Colorado, it reminded me a lot of Colorado. But Juneau, not to be undone by the other folks, has, just to the north of town, its own glacier. One of the things I do remember about going through a residential area was how they put out their trash cans and how they had to enclose them so that the bears do not get in and rip them apart. I also saw a beaver's dam as we were going up to the glacier here. This is Milton Owen Glacier. I want to thank you very, very much for staying with me through all these presentations. I hope you got a little bit of a taste of, of uh, Alaska. Someday I have a video that goes about 30 minutes of this area, and I'd be delighted to show that to you at some time. As I say each week, stay safe. By staying safe, staying in your houses, staying with your masks, we've been able to, to keep the virus away from independent living. We have great sympathy for those that folks in the healthcare center 
that have had the virus, but as I talk periodically with Michael Nathan, the director over there, they're winning the battle. You don't see that in the newspapers, but Michael and the staff have worked very hard. And as you may have seen, we have a lady that is 104 years old that had the virus and is now well. That's thanks to the staff and thanks to that woman who fought the virus. See you next week. Have a good week.